For the last several weeks, we have been journeying through the stories of the Hebrew patriarchs and matriarchs, beginning with Abraham and continuing with his descendants, Isaac and Jacob, and now Joseph. These stories cover biblical centuries of history. My wireless is on. Great. I'm going to start over because I also forgot to pray, which my soul needs before I give a sermon. So let's join our hearts in prayer. God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you. For you, O oh God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For the last several weeks, we have been journeying through the stories of the Hebrew patriarchs and matriarchs, beginning with Abraham and then continuing with his descendants, Isaac and Jacob, and now Joseph. These stories cover biblical centuries of history, and they give us a foundation of understanding what was happening in the world during this time. It helps us understand the relationships between people but also the relationships between people and God. And so the world that we live in these days looks very different from that world, but as we said during our Bible presentation, God is still breathing life into these ancient words, and we still have things to learn. But before we get too far into our passage for today, we need to do a quick catch-up of what has happened between last week's passage in Genesis 37 and this week's passage in Genesis 45. Now, I asked Adam if we could have Donny Osmond come and sing from Joseph in the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, but unlike Joseph's dreams, my dream didn't come true, which is a good thing because we had lovely voices leading us this morning. Last week, we heard the story of the start of Joseph and his brothers. Joseph was having these dreams that made his brothers mad because they made Joseph seem like he was the most important person that ever lived. And so the brothers end up selling Joseph to a group of traders, and Joseph ends up in Egypt, and his brothers go to their father and tell him that Joseph has been killed by a wild animal. Joseph does well for himself at first in Egypt, but then through a series of unfortunate events, he ends up in prison. And while he is in prison, he hears two of Pharaoh's palace workers talking about these dreams that they have had. And being an expert in understanding dreams, Joseph explains to them what will happen. And sure enough, what he says becomes a reality. A few years go by and Joseph is still in prison. And one day Pharaoh is talking to his magi and his wise men and telling them about these dreams and wanting an explanation for what they mean. One of these palace workers who was in prison with Joseph hears Pharaoh asking for this. And he tells Pharaoh that there is a man in your prison that can help you understand these dreams. And so Joseph comes to Pharaoh and he listens to the dreams about fat cows and good corn and skinny cows and bad corn. And Joseph tells Pharaoh that these dreams mean that there will be seven years of good harvest followed by seven years of famine. And so Pharaoh is so impressed with Joseph that he appoints Joseph to be the person who oversees the process of taking care of saving up food during the years of plenty so that there is enough food for everyone during the years of famine. Joseph quickly becomes one of the most powerful people in the house of Pharaoh. People bow down to him, and he has more power than he knows what to do with. It seems like his dreams from all of those years ago have come true. The famine reaches the land of Canaan where Joseph's family, his brothers and his father and his cousins and nieces and nephews are all living. Their father, Jacob, sends a group of the brothers to Egypt so that they can bring back food and not go hungry. And so the brothers leave, leaving Benjamin behind. 
And when they arrive in Egypt and they go to the place where they are to collect their food, who is the person that they are greeted by but their own brother Joseph? Except Joseph does not tell his brothers that it is him. They don't recognize him even though he recognizes them. He uses his power to make things a little more difficult for the brothers than he anticipated. And after how they treated him all those years ago, we can't really blame him, can we? Eventually, all of the brothers are brought back to Joseph. And I picture this dramatic moment where Joseph takes off his headdress with a flourish and an audible gasp comes from the mouths of the brothers as Joseph reveals his identity, which is where our story begins today. It has been a long time since these siblings were together. Their last interaction was not very pleasant. I can imagine that the older brothers have carried a lot of guilt over the years about how they treated their brother Joseph. I'm sure that when they see their father randomly break out into tears and they know it is because he is still mourning the loss of his son, that it made it difficult for them to keep their lie a secret. I'm sure Benjamin, the youngest son and the new favorite son, was frustrated that Jacob never let him go very far from the tent because Jacob was afraid something would happen to Benjamin too. This single emotion-driven decision made by the brothers has changed lives in ways they could never have imagined or predicted. And now here they are, face to face with a brother they left for dead and an opportunity for the family to reconcile and to have a second chance. The stories of the Hebrew patriarchs and matriarchs are filled with similar themes as the story of Joseph. Sibling rivalry and dysfunction, betrayal, jealousy, lying, deceit. If you were to sit down and read chapter 11 of Genesis all the way to the end, you would find these themes and behaviors are repeated between men and women and entire communities. Abraham lied to Pharaoh and said that Sarah was his sister, not his wife, so that Abraham's life would be spared. Rebekah and Jacob trick Isaac into giving away Esau's birthright. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were so wicked that God had no choice but to destroy them. And Jacob doesn't hide his favoritism when it comes to loving Rachel more than his other wives. And that same favoritism extends to the children that he has with Rachel. For generations, the family that began with Abraham has exhibited the same behaviors as the ones that came before them. So it's no wonder when we arrive at the story of Joseph that we see these behaviors and patterns repeated. The system simply can't help it. There is a theory created by psychiatrist Murray Bowen that is known as Bowen Family Systems Theory. This theory uses eight principles to help individuals and families therapists, and even organizations learn why they operate the way they do. It can be very useful when you are trying to figure out why this one person pushes your buttons so much, or if an organization is trying to break free from a cycle of dysfunction, even when its leadership doesn't want to do so. While it originated as a study of individual family units, it can easily be transferred and utilized in organizations, in churches, and in communities. One of these principles of family systems is a theory called multi-generational transmission process. Now I know this sounds complicated, but it really isn't. It just means that the interactions that happen between parents and offspring or family member to family member, whether these actions are conscious or unconscious, these actions are transmitted from generation to generation. Whether it's how your parents process emotions or how you handle conflict with a relative or what happens when you gather for Thanksgiving dinner and that one uncle brings up that one unmentionable topic that no one talks about, all of these interactions have an impact on the immediate family, but they also impact the generations that come after us. This can be a good thing if a family is emotionally and mentally and relationally healthy, but it can also cause generations of harm without the family system even realizing it, 
as is the case with the story of Abraham and the generations that follow him. And it takes a lot of work for a system to make permanent, lasting change if it is stuck in one of these dysfunctional cycles. For some families, it might take a divine intervention. In Genesis 45, it appears that Joseph has had some distance from his family and that this has helped him see that things do not need to continue in the same manner as they always have. Despite the emotional roller coaster that he has been on through his years in Egypt, Joseph seems to have a sense of peace and understanding about how his life has played out. If you go back and read these 15 verses, you will notice that Joseph doesn't actually forgive his brothers in this passage. That comes later. But instead, Joseph takes the blame off of his brother's shoulders. Joseph says, it was God who sent me here. We're going to pause and take a moment to unpack this response for just a minute because we need to be very clear about one thing. Never in the story of Joseph does God say to Joseph or his family, I am the Lord your God and I command that Joseph be sold into slavery and sent to Egypt so that my will can be done. God never says this. In her comments on this passage, Dr. Will Gaffney says, we must understand Joseph's claim of, it was not you who sent me here, but God, as Joseph's perception of his circumstances and his attempt to make sense of what he has experienced by drawing on his own limited understanding of God. It is well within Joseph's right as a person who has experienced trauma to try and understand it and to make sense of it however he sees fit. But it would be very troubling if we as outsiders were to use this passage and claim that God wills the trafficking and enslavement of humanity in order to achieve some kind of universal good. Because that is not at all what God wants for any person at any point in the past, present, or future. We know that bad things happen, hateful and terrible things happen, things happen that we don't like and we don't understand. And sometimes with time and with healing, we can look back and we can see how good has come out of these hateful and terrible and horrible situations. But if we try to force ourselves or force someone else to see the good before they are ready, it can do more harm than we know. It can perpetuate a cycle that needs to be broken, or it can be used as a means to keep someone in a place that is hurtful and damaging. God's will is big and complex, and there is no way that we can ever fully understand it. So choose the safe route. If you are faced with a situation you don't understand, and maybe start by saying, I don't know all of the answers to God's ways, but I know that God is always present and always loving. No matter what the situation is, these are two truths that we know for certain. One thing that we can take from Joseph's comments to his brothers is that he is doing the best he can to try and repair and reconcile his relationship with them. This story introduces us to the idea of restorative justice. Restorative justice emerged in the 1970s through the work of Howard Zare and his attempts to correct some of the weaknesses in the legal system while building on its strengths. His work eventually led to the formation of the Center of Justice and Peace Building, which is housed at Eastern Mennonite University just up the road in Harrisonburg. Rather than focusing on the guilt and punishment of an offender, Restorative justice focuses on the harm that has been done to people and seeks ways to restore damaged relationships by creating obligations and responsibilities for everyone involved, offenders and victims alike. Restorative justice works to reintegrate back into society. In an article written by John Braithwaite, he says it this way, restorative justice is about flipping vicious circles of hurt begetting hurt into virtuous circles of healing begetting healing. Here are a few real world examples of restorative justice. In 1995, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was formed in South Africa as a response to the end of apartheid. 
and an attempt to provide reconciliation for the country, the victims, and the offenders. In 2019, Holocaust survivor Erica Jacobi and former Hitler youth leader Ursula Martins came together and sat on a stage in a high school and shared their stories, and they encouraged the students who were there to work together to prevent future atrocities like the Holocaust from happening. A mother lost her three-year-old son in a gang shooting gone wrong. Her son's killer was a 15-year-old boy named Raymond who was sentenced to prison. Over the years, Raymond began to write to the toddler's mom and he begged for her forgiveness. And eventually, with time and with healing, she began to write back. Together, they decided to enter a restorative justice program sponsored by the prison where they were able to come together and to reach a place of forgiveness and reconciliation. The mother visits Raymond in prison regularly, and he now calls her mom, and she calls him son. In the Christian context, restorative justice has an awful lot in common with salvation. The goal of salvation is to restore the relationship between God and humanity. Salvation invites everyone to assume responsibility for their wrongdoings. Salvation does not condemn us for these wrongdoings, but instead it marks them as a starting point on the journey towards healing and reconciliation. In her book, This Here Flesh, Cole Arthur Riley says that justice has very little concern with good or bad and right or wrong. Justice is much more interested in protecting and affirming the dignity of humanity through tangible actions and opportunities to repair. Justice is not about choosing sides or choosing if one person's dignity is superior to another's. It upholds the dignity of all involved, no matter who it offends or what it costs. Justice doesn't demean an offender's dignity. It affirms their dignity. But justice also communicates that what the offender did is not what the offender was made for. In justice, everyone becomes more human and everyone bears the image of the divine. Once all of Joseph's brothers have returned to Egypt and they stand before him, he looks them in the eyes and he sees their pain and their fear. They are terrified about what is going to happen, terrified that history might repeat itself and Joseph might keep one of them there and they will have to return to Jacob and say, another son is lost. They are terrified that this powerful man might throw them in a pit and leave them there. After all, that's exactly what they deserve, right? But Joseph sees them and he can't pretend any longer. He sends everyone away and he says to his brothers, it's me, I'm Joseph, come close to me. He sees their dignity and their humanness and he takes the first step and breaking the vicious circle of hurt, and he begins to turn it into a virtuous circle of healing. He assures them that while their actions have caused them distress at, and anger at themselves and at one another, God gave Joseph a dream. And this dream was for a beloved community that Joseph would be a part of. This beloved community would bless nations and provide food for the hungry and a safe place to land when everything else was lost. And for Joseph's family, this beloved community would be a place where reconciliation and eventually forgiveness would be offered and received. As they wrap their arms around each other and embrace and shed tears together, we remember that no matter the obstacles and the challenges, God is always with us, and God never forgets us. In the midst of our frailty and our wrongdoings, God is working, and God is dreaming about a future that involves us choosing love over all things. When we choose reconciliation, justice, and love over revenge, division, and hatred, then we are living into God's dream for the world. When we look into the eyes of a person who has caused us pain or harm and we choose to see their dignity instead of their shortcomings, God's dream comes true. 
And God's dreams can't come true without our participation in making them a reality. So we've got some work to do. Let's join in that work together.